So yes, functional programming, but first some absolute basics. Je m'appelle Paul. J'habite en Angleterre. Et j'ai 14 ans. In theory. There we go. Now the French speakers in the room will know I am not 14 years old. But this tells you A, how long ago I learned French. A long time and B, how bad my French is. So I hope I set the bar suitably low for the rest of this talk. So yes, functional coding, but just I'm really pleased to be in here with you, because right now, apparently, this is the only place in the world where it rains more than the UK. It's flooding outside. This is crazy. I thought it'd be great here. And even worse, if the floods weren't bad enough, there are riots over Nutella. <laughs> What's wrong with you? So at the party tonight, you've got to keep me safe from the floods and the Nutella rioters, please. So functional coding. Functional coding, there we go. When people see these words, they can sometimes get a little bit afraid. They hear functional, they think, oh, this is not for me, it's very boring, not applicable. I don't think so, okay? I get that. But in this talk, I want to try and give you some real quick wins. Quick wins. Because sometimes you get words like monads and funk doors and applicatives thrown around, and it can seem very dry and very academic and not for you, when it really is. So this concept of quick wins I have shamelessly stolen from an ex-Apple engineer called Andy Matushak. And the idea is that he talks about lightweight encounters. You dip in, get some quick wins, and run away for it gets too hard. But the real question is, why bother? What you're doing right now works, right? Your current declarative approach is fine. Why change? Well, it turns out there are a few informal conventions, you know, rules to functional programming. What makes good functional code? One of them is we rely very strongly on immutability. We like using constants everywhere. And of course, Swift enforces this for us. You try and change a constant, you get nothing at all. It won't even compile. Good functional code avoids state. That's all those little properties you store away, settings and so forth. It might start like this, but after a few months, if not years, what you normally get is a much messier situation. So good functional code avoids state. You pass values into a function, change them inside the function, and return new values. You avoid external stuff. And of course, this makes your code significantly easier to test. You know that function A will always return 1, 2, 3 for the same values every single time, regardless of any properties you might be using. Good functional code is composable. You write small functions that do one, maybe two things, then combine them together to make bigger functions like Lego bricks. But most importantly, good functional code allows us to express our intent clearly. It clarifies our intent using a quote stolen from Javier Soto from Twitch. He says it allows us to express what we want to achieve rather than how it's implemented. Smart man. Now, enough intro. Let's get to the code. Something with map. Map works great on collections and optionals. And when you're starting, easy collections, OK? What it does is it transforms stuff. Values come in, get transformed by a closure you write, and emitted as transformed values. For example, 1, 2, 3, 4, map can double that to be 2, 4, 6, 8. Nice and easy. Take some English words, camping, parking, and weekend. We can say, hey, map, make that French. As Dumas said, English is just French badly pronounced. Map could even try and make Olympic Marseille into a good football team, but probably not. Now, <laughs> as an example, imagine a function which accepts an array of names, John, Paul, George, and Ringo, and you want this function to transform those names into the lengths of those names. Nice and simple. We know that John has four, Paul has four, George has six, Ringo has five. Array of strings in, int array of counts back. If you're doing that declaratively, you would say length of string, string array going in, return int array, make a new empty int array, loop over the strings, Add my count to the int array, end the loop, and return the result. That is your declarative function. To do that imperator, to do that functionally, you would say, step one, get rid of all that code. Step two, you'd write strings.map.0.count. Step three, 
Well, there is no step three. That's all your code now. And the best bit is the function signature hasn't changed. All the code that calls this function can be as nasty as it is right now. This code can be improved. So you can go ahead and chisel away at your bad code base and improve it as you go. Now, if you don't use close as much, $0 just means the element being passed in. So John, then Paul, then George, then Ringo. Now, this code is shorter. Of course, this code's shorter. But that's not the real win here, OK? This code is immutable. That variable integer array, pff, gone. But it also clarifies what we're trying to do. Our intent's clear. When you call map on a sequence like I did there, it must transform all the items in there. You can't bail out partway through for laughs. Internally to Swift, it looks a bit like this. I've simplified it slightly. This is map internally to Swift in the standard library. Map transforms some generic thing, returns a generic array of T, creates a new empty array of T, loops over the items itself, and then transforms the item, puts it into the return value, then ends the loop, returns return value, and returns a function. That's exactly the same code you would have written, except now it's Swift's problem. Now it's Ben's problem from Apple to make that work better, which means they can optimize that over time to be better and faster, and you don't care. Your code just improves. You can map all sorts of things. Here's an integer array, 100, 885. We could say, map that into strings. Your score was $0. So your score would be 100, score 80, score 85. We could have <coughs> Amstramagram. Come on, where's the applause for my French, eh? <laughs> thank you, thank you. We could say, I want to map that to be uppercase. And I'll just return those things uppercase. We could say, here's an array of doubles, to, uh, 4, 9, and 16. We could pass that straight to the square root function and get back 2, 3, 4. You can map all sorts of things. Now, actually, earlier, um, Daniel Steinberg gave me a, a lovely analogy for how map works similar to UI views in UI kit. We're very comfortable with the idea of saying, here's a view. I want you to animate with a five-second duration from where you are down to the bottom right corner, and it will do so. We haven't got to tell it exactly where to be in every frame of the animation. We just say the start point and the end point, the transformation, and let UI kit sort it out. Very similar to map. So that is map. Move on. Flat map. In a smaller type, compact map, it's being renamed because, of course, you know, Swift, hurrah. Uh, in Swift 4.1, which just came out in Xcode 9.33 years ago, it's now compact map, this precise usage I'm talking about. Um, but it's very similar to map. You're already mapping your brain. You're thinking, well, there's a transformation happening here. Of course, there is. But the second part, the flat slash compact part, it does something really cool. After the map transformation completes, it will unwrap your optionals, then throw away any nils for you. And nil occurs in all sorts of places in Swift. Swift loves nil, like fable initializers, or try question mark, or conditional typecasts, and so forth. All of these, when they fail, return nil. So when you say, create an integer from this string number 5, A will actually be an optional integer. Because you may have said, no, as your number. And of course, <laughs> love the French, don't you? Anyway, you get nil back for that. So nil. Brilliant. Good food for flat map. Let's see how the flat map thinks of that. We can say, here's an array of one five fish. Dear flat map, please put that through the int initializer. And what you get back is, this numbers array will be an int array. Not optionality here whatsoever. It's a real int array. It'll work out like this. We have one five fish. It goes through the int initializer, which is failable. Comes back with optional one, optional five nil. The flattening, the compacting part kicks off, unwraps the optionals, tosses away the nils, Outcomes one, five. Beautiful. So anywhere you have failable initialize, you should be thinking, ooh, flat map. For example, got an array of strings that might be URLs, might not be. Let's find out. Try and make URLs out of them, if we're lucky. There we go. If it fails, flat map tosses them away. You've got an array of UI views, some of which might be UI image views. Great, just do a conditional typecast. The ones you get back are image views. You can even just do this. There's no transformation happening here. You're just saying, please give me your lovely compacting behavior, please. Unwrap optionals and toss away the nils. That's flat map. Now, both of these things work on optionals, too. You can do an optional map and an optional flat map. And they work in slightly different ways. Think of an option as being a box. Map will open the box. It'll extract the contents of a box some Nutella, <laughs> and it of course transform that into vast amounts of money right now for the rioters. And then it will put that thing back in the box. So it rewraps it back in an optional again. Get an optional, you end up with an optional. 
So in code, if you imagine a method like this, get user ID, give it an ID number 97. If it exists, you get a string back. If it doesn't, you get nil back. So it's an optional string return value. We can pass that thing through map. And if name is nil, nothing happens. You get back nil immediately. But if name is not nil, you'll get hi, username, hi, Jean-Pierre. And then you can say, go ahead and print the greeting, nil coalescing, unknown user. Now, to do the same thing declaratively, you might say the same call start, then an empty constant, do a quick unwrap, put it into the variable, then do have an else block, We're lucky, there we go, unknown user, end the else, and then print out the greeting, oops, crazy. there we go. Now, easy enough. But what if what's in the box isn't what you thought? You open the box, out comes your prize, transform to big cash, but this time it is optional. What happens then? Let's find out. So here we have an optional string containing five. We say, OK, let's try and map that to an integer. What type is result? Spoiler, it is not an integer. It's not even an optional integer. What you've got here is the lesser known and completely never wanted optional, optional integer, which really screws with your head. No one wants to see these things. Now, when we said map, what we meant to say really was flat map. And now, result will be a regular optional int that we feel much more comfortable with. You see, when you call map on an optional, and your transformation closure returns an optional, map just puts them together. You get an optional optional. Flat map is able to say, it's the same container. Let's join them together. It can turn that into a single optional. Either the whole thing is there, or the whole thing is not there. So if your transformation closure returns an optional, use flat map. Let's move on. Filter. You like coffee in France, don't you? Filtering. <laughs> Filtering is where you can say, here is a condition I want to check, pass this uh, collection or sequence through this uh, filter and see what comes out. For example, I have an array of red and blue boxes, and I have a filter looking for blue boxes. I can now say, run it through, the reds are thrown away, blues come back, that's my return value. So, time for some examples, and let's of course play to the crowd a little bit. Let good wine equals wine.filter, origins France. <laughs> uh, let band equals players dot filter has prefix Kevin. <laughs> so band it will call Kevin from the thing. Great. You can filter whatever you like. Let's filter these numbers based on whether they are odd or not using modulus. And there's so many more. There's Swift packed with these lovely functional uh, functions you can call on. I love the first method. This will find the first score over 85 like that. If you've got an array of numbers, 9, 5, 3, 5, and you know how cat often they appear? Trivial. You can put it through map to make an array of tuples. So it'll produce an array like this, 9, 1, 5, 1, 3, 1, 5, 1. And then Swift 4, there's a new dictionary initializer that will treat that array of tuples as key value pairs. So keys 1, values 1, uh, keys 3, values 1, and so forth. It's called unique in keys with. And when it finds a collision in the keys, like it will for 5 and 5, it'll add the one and the one together. So the result will be nine appears once, five appears twice, three appears once. It's trivial to do. Here's a classic one you'll see in so many talks, how to add an array of numbers using reduce and plus. It's shown so many times because it's beautiful. It shows you how Swift just totally blurs the lines between functions and methods and operators and closures. It's one big thing of beautifulness in Swift. You can even take, if you're ready for more French, you can even take non-functional things you know already and apply them. Here's an array. Oui, oui, bien sûr. <coughs> you can say, does that contain oui? You know this. There's a contains method in arrays. You know this. And there's a, a string contains. We can say, ma réponse est oui. Does it contain oui? Oui. Put the two together. You can now say, here's my array of words. Oui, oui, bien sûr. Here's my string. And then say yes.contains where reply.contains. Do any of those words appear in that string? Done. Now, there are some challenges to switching to a more functional approach. Of course there are. First up, muscle memory. When you sit down at your desk ready to face the same problems you faced before, you naturally reach for the same solutions you used before. Switching to map or flat map or reduce or whatever you want to do 
is a, a mental jump, but it's worth it. Second up, some folks will tell you Swift is not a functional language, not a true functional language. And you know, it's semantics. It's functional, it's protocol oriented, it's declarative, it's object oriented. It's good. But one of the biggest ones is that state is comfortable. We like storing things in properties, right? And then referring to them later on. So getting away from that, getting into what you might call a pure function, where you only refer to the values inside the function, takes uh, work. And that's okay. So let's wrap up. First up, I hope you learned something new. I hope you're impressed by my French. <laughs> Second up, I hope you weren't too scared. I did try and keep it as simple as possible, quite as, a, as applicable as possible. And thirdly, I hope that tomorrow you can go back to your desk and uh, apply what you've learned. She just learned functional programming. Look how happy she is, right? That could be you. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. <laughs>